Good morning. Welcome to Grace Point. We are excited to be here. We're excited to see you. If you're visiting with us, please fill out a guest card. We'd love to meet you afterwards. You can um, put that card either in the offering plate as it goes around or meet us um, at the high top table after church. Um, just a couple announcements for you guys. Uh, most of them are in the bulletin that you got walking in. Um, our brave and beloved, our ladies Bible study is this Thursday, um, 6 p.m. at Biddle's. Um, if you don't have a book, I've made copies, so you can still attend. Um, we'd love to have you there. Um, our intro class is next Sunday, March 10th, um, following the service. This is a class just to kind of get to know the church. Um, if you're new or you're just checking it out or you've been here for a while and haven't really had an opportunity to see what Josh is, um, well, really God's vision that Josh, that has, he has given to Josh, Pastor Josh. I don't know, that's weird for me since I'm his wife. <laughs> um... So that class is next week. We do ask that you sign up. Um, lunch will be provided. Um, so we ask that you sign up for that so we know how many to serve. Um, and then our Easter um, faith adventure with the children is coming up in a couple weeks, March 17th from 3 to 5. Bring your family. Um, it's going to be a good time. If you feel led to donate some candy, we do need some candy for that event. Um, so if you could start bringing that in in the next couple weeks so we can um, give those to the children. And that's it. Check us out on Facebook um, or our website for more ministries and events. Let's stand and worship together.
and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. 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 So as most of you know, I teach on Wednesday nights. Um, what you don't know is my f three favorite days when I was in school were the last day of school, the day we were having a movie, or the day we were going on a field trip. So on Wednesday night, March 20th, we're going to incorporate two of my two of my favorite days, a movie night and a field trip. 
We're going to go see the Ark in the Darkness, and Stephen is going to play us the trailer. Ever since 2020, the world has irrevocably changed. With every month passing, seeming to get stranger and stranger. It's scary to think what the future holds as we march forward together, facing a certain inevitability, a prophetic time that can only be described as biblical. There was an ancient world. The fall of man. That's why God sent the flood. It was a judgment that happened. It changed the world profoundly. There is yet a future judgment coming. It'll be just as it was in the days of Noah. In the last days, the end times. They will be surprised when Jesus comes. Theaters March 20th and 21st only. A movie like this is a great opportunity for us. It is a great opportunity to invite someone who would normally not come to church, but we can get them to come to a movie where they can learn about creation, where we can learn that there is another judgment coming and that Jesus is coming back. Um, tickets for this are $15. Um, everyone's going to be responsible for their own tickets. Now, that being said, if you know someone that wants to go, and that's going to be a struggle for them, let myself, let Pastor Josh know. We want people to attend. We want people to go to this. Um, it's it's going to be a great time. It's going to be a great opportunity. My scripture for today for call for worship. Oh, by the way, there will be a sign-up sheet next week for this, um, just so we have a rough idea how many seats to save when we all get there. Um, my scripture for today is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 through 10. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Could I have the ushers, please? We've all been given gifts. We are called to be good stewards, to serve one another, to serve each other, to serve the lost, to help make a way. Heavenly Father, I pray that we are serious and watchful in our prayer life. I pray, Lord, that we love one another as you have first loved us. Lord, you've loved us. You loved us clean to the cross. Lord, and we are to love others as you have loved us. Uh, 
Lord, I pray that we use the gifts that are given to us freely by you through your spirit to share your word and to share your will and to share you with the lost. Lord, I pray that as we give today, we give so with a heart of love to carry on your word, to carry on your ministry, Lord, to be a blessing to others. Lord, I pray that we open our hearts today to your word for what pastor has to say and teach us. Lord, open our ears, but open the eyes of our heart to receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. chosen, trusting in the God of love, the God of hope, the God of atonement. We are church. We believe in one way, one truth, one life. Devoted, eyes fixed on the prize, devoted to Christ. We are church. We put God first. We are like-minded people created in Christ for good works, made in the image of greatness, made to reflect the greatest love ever known. We are church. The light in the dark, the hope to the hopeless, a brand new start, peace for the broken heart, a love that has open arms. We are church. Not for walls. We are a body of believers following the call, the call to know we are forgiven, the call to love without condition, the call to trust without division. We are church, a community with open doors, serving the poor, living for more. We are broken people with a united cause, an unbroken love and a divided society proclaiming Jesus is Lord. judge, we don't hold a grudge, we are not perfect, but we aspire to love, we are church. Amen, we are church, amen. At this time, our kids can be dismissed, because I know they've been itching to go downstairs, and they're excited for that, so look at all them kids, that's awesome, that is awesome. I actually might go down there with them, who wants to come up here and preach today? That's awesome. Praise the Lord. So we are church. I love that video, but how many of you enjoyed Bishop Witter being with us last week? Amen? Yeah. If, I mean, I know he's not here, but I mean, I thought it was really good. I thought everything that he said was on point. And what's funny is he didn't even know what I was talking about this week. But uh, uh, so I was just really encouraged by his message and by what his his view of the church and what God's view of the church was. And, and so I'm excited to continue to uh, talk to you today. Today is our Vision Sunday. And the Bible says that uh, if you don't have a vision, the people will perish. And so uh, it's very important for us to have a vision for what we're doing for the future, for today, for tomorrow, and the future of what's going to happen here at Grace Point Community. So I am so glad you're here. Um, before I do that, a little, another little plug that uh, my wife, I don't remember if she said this or not, and if you did, I'm sorry, honey. Uh, I was just focused on your beauty that was standing up here as you were announcing, but uh, I know Valentine's Day is over, but that's all right. But um, we are having baptisms, baptisms and child dedication. That's very important to us here. So if you've never been baptized, if you've never had any of your kids uh, dedicated, it's okay. Even if they're 30 years old, you can still, we'll dedicate them here. It's fine. But uh, we're going to be doing that in the next few weeks. Um, and actually, I think I might do something a little bit creative. I'm not going to share that with you uh, just yet, but... But um, I was thinking about it over there, but we are doing that. So if that's something that interests you and you've never been baptized or or you just feel the need, the Holy Spirit is kind of tugging at your heart to be baptized, sign up the, the papers in the, the hallway in the lobby right there out there. But And if we could, if we can continue to keep in our prayers, the Rhodes family and also uh, the DeShong family, they're going through a lot. 
Uh, and so continue to keep them in your prayers, and we'll pray for them after service today. But uh, one of the things, I, I, I kind of hesitated to put this in here to start this off. We're starting this new series, We Are the Church. And you know what my problem is? Dad, don't say I have multiple problems because I'm waiting for it. One of my, let me rephrase this. One of my problems is, okay, I have a lot of problems. I'm sure some of you know those problems, but I have a lot of problems. But one of my more specific problems that I have with the church today, and Bishop kind of talked about it, um, but one of the problems that I have, well, let me just tell it to you. So my problem started when I started reading this. Most of you probably have one of one of these out there. It's a Bible, if you didn't know what that was. Um, so I don't have the first Bible that I really kind of like looked at uh, because that was a little bit old school. But I'm going to ask you something. Who out here has a Bible with those little things on the side of it, the little tabs? You know what I'm talking about, those tabs? Do you have it with you today? Can I show, can I, Tracy, I'm going to pick on you since you said you have one. Look at that. I'm, I didn't think somebody would have one. This is awesome. I'm going to keep this, Tracy. Thank you for the new Bible. Oh, Zach. Thanks, bud. So, but, so I had one of these Bibles in school, like in middle school, so to speak, second grade area, and you see it has the little tabs on there, right? Can everybody see the tabs there? And for those of you, how many of you guys, you remember these, right? Some of you have them. You raise your hand that you have them. For those of you that have digital Bibles, you guys are high class for the digital Bibles. Zach, thank you for, thank you. I'll give it back, even though I want to keep it, because it's easier for me. And you guys are like, what's he doing? Just stay with me here. For those of you guys that have the digital Bibles, you got it easy. You can turn to your phone. You can, like the pastor says, hey, I want you to turn to the book of Amos. Guess what? I can just go here on my little U, U version app, and I can go to the book of Amos. On that bad boy, I had it right there. It was like an open book test for me. So like when the pastor would say, hey, go to the book of Amos, I would start to struggle before I had that. I start to sweat. I'm like, oh, man. What's famous? Is it like famous Amos cookies? Have anybody heard of those? I didn't know what it was. Yeah, famous Amos. We got. I got a story for. Yeah, I'm not even gonna go there. I was stealing my dad's famous Amos cookies a long time ago. But anyways. So the pastor would say, go to the book of Amos, and I'd start sweating. So I got those little tabs like Zach has so I could find Amos real easy. But my problem was when I started reading the Bible, when I started going into actually digging in as I got older and as I got more serious about it, when I started reading in Scripture and compared it to what I saw in the church, it wasn't so good. <laughs> It, it, it didn't really, it kind of paled, the church kind of paled in comparison to what God said in the word. And that's, that's kind of dangerous, but that's truthfully, that's what I saw as a teenager growing up. You know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the church that I grew up at, Pastor Duncan's was here a couple weeks ago, was a great pastor, a great church, but... It didn't have really good intentions, let me say this, but oftentimes we would fall short of the mark that God had for our church, very often. You know, and as this young person, as this teenager or young adult, whatever you want to call me, it kind of went over my head. It was one of those things where I didn't really understand some of the things. Uh, I often felt bored. I felt disconnected. You know, we'd have, you know, the the cool like coffee shop in the in the one church called Hebrews. Oh, how 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 creative is that, right? I mean, but uh, but so you know, I but I felt disconnected. I did not feel like there was real community in the church. And so as I read more and more, and I got dig, I dug deeper into God's word. What kind of like was brought out to me and the Holy Spirit showed me, it almost seemed like we were doing church embarrassingly safe. We were safe. We were comfortable. We were doing church so, so it would be convenient for us. So it would be just safe. But here's what I know, church. 
for those of you that are here that are with us online. When I read about Jesus in the Bible, when I read about him in the scriptures, there is nothing safe about Jesus, the Son of God. Nothing safe. And I'm going to explain what I mean. Because this guy, he healed people. This guy touched lepers. This guy befriended prostitutes. He enlisted tax collectors to be part of his closest discipleship team. And you see, when I would grow up and I'd look around at people at the church, leaders in the church, you know, youth group leaders or, or whatever, I'd look around at people and I would see them and it was easy to see some folks be kind of narrow-minded at times. It was easy to see some of those people be judgmental at times. It was easy to see some of them be hypocritical at times. And if I'm being honest, you know, it was easy to see them and they weren't following what God's word said. And that was some of the people in our church. And so as a young man, I struggled with this. Anybody else been there before? You don't have to raise your hand. Well, some of you can, but you don't have to. But you see, that's where I was. What God's view of the church, like Bishop said last week, was not what we were, we were at and what we were becoming. And so I struggled with it. Because I saw Jesus and I saw what, he's, what he was like and I saw his life. And I looked at him and, and Jesus loved those who hated him, didn't he? He loved those who hated him. He blessed the people that persecuted him. And he welcomed everybody. Even those that, re, that religion rejected, Jesus loved and welcomed. But when you looked at the church, that was kind of not evident sometimes. And I know there's no perfect church. We have the signs. We are not perfect here at all. If you're a visitor with us, I will be the first to tell you that. There is no perfect church. Jesus Christ is perfect, and that's who we strive to live by. But my problem was when I started reading the Bible, you know, it just it paled in what we were doing, what the church was, paled in comparison to what Jesus said and what I read about him in the Scripture. And so a few years ago, when I got married, when Rachel and I got married, we had this vision that we wanted to be part of an, a Jesus honoring church, a church that would be welcome for everyone, a church where everyone would be needed, everyone would play a part, and everyone would be changed and be healthy spiritually. That is our goal. That is our heartbeat. And so we have a mission here, I believe, and our family has this mission, and I think it's very simple. I think it's very clear. I think it's very focused, and you know, here's the thing. Our mission is to seek people, to love people, and to share the story. What is the story, you might say? The story is the gospel. And if for those of you that maybe are unchurched, the gospel, that word actually means the good news. So we are to share the good news of Jesus Christ with everybody that we come into contact with, amen? And so like, that is our mission. And so, would you say that with me? Our mission is to seek people, love people, and share the story. Seek people, love people, share the story. That is what I believe our mission here and our mission for our family is at this church. So, one of our goals, though, to reach people is in the mission, I should say, um, in reaching that mission is to lead people to become fully devoted, devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus did not come into this world to condemn the world, but to save the world. He came that you and I might have life. Amen? He came that you and I could have life and live life to the fullest. So today we're starting this series, We Are the Church. And today's message, if I was going to title it, I don't know if it's in your bulletins or not, but it, it would be called Devoted. Devoted. So would you pray with me right now? Father God... Lord, I thank you. <clears throat> God, I, I thank you that uh, you gave us your word. I thank you that Jesus said that he would build the church. God, I pray that we focus on that. God, I, I acknowledge that this right here is your church. Grace Point Community Church of God in Williamsburg, PA, this is your church. It's nobody else's church but yours. God, I, I pray that your glory is evident through the lives of the people here. Would you strengthen your church, God? Would you uplift 
this church, God? Would we be a church that is honoring Jesus in every single way? God, empower us in this world, and this very dark world as we just watched a video, but empower us, Father. Use your people, your church, to become fully devoted Christ followers. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, I don't know. I'm having a hard time today. I don't know if you guys noticed this, but I just feel like I this is passionate for me. I am very excited about what I'm going to share with you today. But if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Uh, and we're going to be starting in uh, verse 42. So, if you have that. Um, but what I want to do is I want to give you some context a little bit of Acts chapter 2. So we are at a time where Jesus, he had just um, given his life on the cross. He'd just given his life on the cross, but get ready for it. He rose from the dead. Amen. He rose from the dead. He's no longer there. He's alive and well. But, uh, you know, at that time, he rose from the dead. He defeated death. He defeated hell, the grave. And to me, I know we're watching a movie in a couple weeks, but that's the greatest story that I could ever hear, right? Amen. So that's where we are. Jesus has died, rose from the dead, uh, and he's, uh, he's with, with our Lord and Savior, well, or with God. But so there's a guy, there's a guy, Peter, okay? There's a guy, Peter, who you've probably all heard of. Peter was a hothead. He was a fisherman. So he probably would have liked it around here, probably would have lived around here and gone trout fishing. That was Peter. He would have been hanging out with some of you guys. And so this guy, though, Peter, he's just like the rest of us. He's a screw up. He always made mistakes. He was hot headed. Okay. Well, maybe some of you aren't hot headed, but he was messed up. And he got his life changed by Jesus. He was forgiven by Jesus. And what he's doing in Acts chapter 2, before we read where we're going to read, is he's preaching to all these people. And he's preaching to these people. He's preaching to them about repentance. He's preaching to them about grace, about God's grace. And so he's preaching to them, and there's 3,000 people that came to know who Jesus Christ was because of what Peter was preaching. Amen? So... That's kind of like a mega church, the first mega church, in my opinion. Uh, it's right there in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. And so at the very beginning, we see what this group of New Testament believers, the, what they are, what they did as the church. And I'm going to show you this scripture in Acts chapter 2 that, uh, that I really enjoy. And I think we've actually talked about it a couple Wednesday nights here. But the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, uh, they devoted. Somebody say they devoted. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm devoted. Look at your other neighbor and say, I'm devoted. So Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, And they devoted themselves. What did they devote themselves to? Watch this. It's on the screen if you don't have your Bible. To the teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. They were devoted to Jesus and the things of Jesus. Teaching, prayer, fellowship. And everyone, this is amazing, watch this. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were unified. They were together and they had everything in common. That they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. And this to me is mind-blowing. Watch what's next. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And watch this. The Lord did what? He added to their number. How often? Daily. The Lord added to their number daily those who are born into the kingdom of God daily those who were being saved like i said earlier that was my problem when i started reading scripture what i saw in the church kind of paled in comparison to what acts chapter 2 tells us what the church should be like right it started to it was pale to me it was pale from what i saw in the word of god and i'm going to show you i'm going to tell you a version of what josh kirksey saw and this is my version I'm going to read it from the different version. You probably have never heard of it. It's called the MDV version, which stands for the modern day version. This version 
It's not a real version too, by the way, so don't go look it up. But this is what I saw. And honestly, I, I'm, I'm pained to say this. We kind of see this in some places today. It, I believe it would say they were devoted to their comfort. They were devoted, they, were, they devoted to their comfort, to their happiness, to their personal goals, to their dreams, to their bucket lists. No one really noticed the Christians because they focused on themselves. They were consumers. Very full of, very few of the believers were, were together. And when they were, they fought about stupid stuff. If they sold anything, guess what? They used the money to buy something better for themselves. And if they claim to love God, but they didn't, they claim to love God, but they don't even love each other. So they felt empty. They felt alone and depressed. And as a result, most people disliked them and very few lives were changed. You know, I say that in joking, but isn't that kind of true, today's modern church? Isn't that kind of true if we're being totally honest? And there's not all churches are like that, and I don't believe our church is like that. But we need to be careful because we can fall into those traps. And obviously God has something way better for his church, doesn't he? Way better for this church, for any of his churches. And so I want to encourage you, if you want a different type of a year, if you want different results in your family, I would suggest you need a different mindset about our own role. What are we supposed to do? Who are we supposed to be in God's church? What's our role? And so I want to give you this morning, um, quickly, I want to give you three mindset changes for our church, and they're found in Acts chapter 2. And the first one, to me, is incredibly important. It's so important to me. Number one, who are we going to be? What is our church going to be? I believe we should be an intensely devoted church. Devoted to what? To lead people to become fully devoted to Jesus Christ. Fully devoted. In fact, the Bible says they devoted. They devoted themselves to the things of Jesus. To the teachings of Jesus, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And one of the most important words you're going to find in the New Testament is that word devoted. Devoted. So, I'm going to try to say this. Devoted is actually a Greek word, and it, it's called proskytero. Pro, let me try this again. Proskytero. Proskytero. It's not easy to say that, is it? Proskytero. That's what the word devoted means. It means to live in constant state of relentless pursuit. Devoted. Constant state of relentless pursuit. So what is it? It's persistent. It's ongoing. It's, it's devotion to something. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that these disciples are devoted to that. In the things of Jesus. It's this constant relentless pursuit of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 2 we read and we see that. And the reality is, we got our own proskytero, right? We do. Each, every single one of us in this place right now has our own proskytero. We have our own ongoing obsession. I pray that it's for Jesus, but probably not. For some of us, it might be their kids, because obviously our kids are very important to us. We had them, so we might as well love them, right? <laughs> I mean, let's be truthful. But they keep us really, really busy, right? And our lives just seem to revolve around our kids. We're taking them here. We're taking them there. We're taking them to this sporting event. We're going to this sporting event. And our life just seems to revolve around our kids. For others, it could be your career. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's what you do. You're fully devoted to that job. Why? Because you want to be successful. For some of you, it might be a hobby. Might be a hobby that you do. You're, maybe it used to be CrossFit, or now it's pickleball, or whatever you young people are playing nowadays. I don't know what pickleball is, never, but I don't know what it is. But for some of you, it might be like your, your, your wardrobe. It might be your shoe game. I mean, look, I wish our camera was better. Look at these J's I got on right now. Could be your shoes, yeah. Chef, he's showing me off his new balances. 
You know, for some of us, it's, it's keeping up with the Joneses, right? It's going on our dream vacation, having enough money in the bank, certain amount, financial success, the house. Maybe for some of you, it's you Swifty fans, it's getting your hands on some good Swifty tickets. Taylor Swift, for those of you that are older that don't know who Swifty is. But whatever it is, it's taking up the majority share of your heart. It's taking up your focus, your affection, and what the Bible would say, your devotion. It's taking up what God is supposed to be in, involved. And so for some of us, is that. And there's far too many people, I believe, that call themselves a follower of Christ who have a more than casual or comfortable approach to Jesus. And so they're, I like to call them cultural Christians. Why? Because they're not fully devoted to the, his teachings. They're not fully devoted to him. But you see, church, this first century form of believers, this first century church, they were sold out. They were all in. Nothing was going to stop them. They were fully devoted, Scripture says, followers of Jesus Christ. So my challenge to you is you want to have a better year. You want to have a good year for your family. We will be intensely devoted to the things that matter most the gospel of Jesus Christ. We won't be casual, comfortable Christians, but in full devotion to a God that loves us so much that he sent his only son to die on the cross for me and for you. Because of who Jesus is, because of what he's done, I believe in my vision for our church this year is we will be intensely devoted to Jesus Christ. Amen? Number two, I'm not going to be long today. Somebody said, praise the Lord, amen. Number two, we will be an irrationally generous church. Irrationally generous. In every possible way that we can, I want to be irrationally generous as a church. If you remember in the early portion of the text that I just read to you, we saw that they sold all their possessions. That's some crazy folks right there. They sold all of their possessions and gave to anyone that had a need. And I want, I want you to see what happens uh, two chapters later. In Acts chapter 4, verse 33, it says this. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in all of them. Watch this. That there was no needy persons among them. God was working so much in them because they didn't care about themselves. They cared about others. There was no needy persons among them. Notice, there was no government programs to help assist people because the government wasn't necessary to meet the church, or I mean to meet the needs of the people. Why? Because the church was right there. Isn't that awesome? Can you imagine if our church was right there for this community and for every single person that had a need and God was just blessing us and blessing us and blessing us that there would be no need for food assistance, that there would be no need for the essentials pantry that we do? How awesome is that? That's what, Acts, that's what happened in Acts chapter 4. The church was meeting the needs of the people. So I believe we need to be an irrationally generous church. And I want to tell you a brief story of how my heart, I believe, was built around this concept. And I thought about this uh, the, other, the other night. Steve, if you want to show that picture that I sent you. So this is Rachel and I, our first church that we pastored. Our very, very, very first church. So there's the building. Not a very big building. Kind of looks a little rough, and it was a little rough. <laughs> um, so that was the first church. We had basically no parking lot. But the first church that we pastored, we had nothing. No phone. The chairs weren't even ours. They were borrowed chairs. We didn't have, like, the cool screens that you can see this on. We had nothing like that. And when we arrived, I think there was maybe eight people, ten people. I'm not... 100% sure on that. It was small. But so those people had said, Pastor, hey, we rent this, this facility for $1,700 a month, and there was only eight of them, okay? So it was, yeah, yeah. I heard somebody say, wow. I said a lot more than wow. I said all oh, my heart. <laughs> but so that's, that's where we were. 
and they had rented uh, another facility that they had owned, the Church of God in Ohio owned, uh, to another church. Well, when we got there, they came to me and they said, Pastor, they have all of our, our, all of our equipment. They have our chairs. They have our video. They have our video screens. Um, they have everything that we could use on a Sunday morning this other church had. And I felt the Holy Spirit telling me, you know what, Josh, now you cannot go take from that other church just so you guys can have church. You can't do that. And I, I was adamant. I was firm. We are not going to go take our stuff back. We're not going to be Indian givers. Uh, and so there was a few people that gave me a, a few problems uh, with that uh, because they wanted us to go take what was rightfully ours. And I held firm. And I said, no, we're going to be irrationally generous to people. And they're having church just like we are. So God will provide. God will make it through. And so we, I don't know, probably for about a month, maybe a month or two, we had service and, you know, nobody, we would sing songs, nobody would know the words because we didn't have screens. So I, every time worship would come, the guy that was leading our worship would look at me and just kind of shrug, like, I'm like, yeah, I don't know, just go ahead, sing, sing something, you know, but so one day uh, I got this Facebook message from a gentleman that I did not know. And the gentleman said, hey, uh, I know you don't know me, um, but I was woken up last night and I just feel the Lord wanted me to give you something. And I'm like, OK, this guy's going to be one of those weirdos, you know, one of those weird, weird dudes. And, and I usually tend to attract those. So I'm not saying Rachel's weird, but <laughs> but I tend to like, I know I'm digging a hole. But I tend to, like, for some reason. But anyways, so this guy says, hey, I'm not coming to your church. I ain't going to be one to sit in the pew or whatever. I'm not going to be there on Sunday morning. But I feel the Lord wants me to give you something. So after church on Sunday, can I come there and meet you? And I said, yeah, sure, absolutely. And try to pack and be packing my gun when the guy comes in. But uh, so anyways, the guy, we have service just like we had the the past month or two and this guy shows up in our parking lot and he takes out of his SUV two 65 70 inch TVs that he said the Lord told me that you have a need for these right and I said I honestly I didn't know what to do or say I just kind of started getting teary eyed I said yeah we do and so we were able to he gave us the two TVs for free so we were able to put them on our wall. We were able to do that. And then I just started sticking to what this principle was, Acts chapter 2, and some of the things that I saw the church and for that church. And it was a very small church. And wouldn't you know, when we started to be faithful, when people started to give, and, you know, I know when a pastor gets up and he asks people to give, oh, my gosh, all they want is my money. No, that's not that's not what this is at all. But see, when we started to do that and there was people that didn't give, I don't know how they made it through the lease, to be honest with you, because the lease was extremely high. But when they started to say, you know what, Lord, it's not mine. It's yours. Here you go. You do what you want with it. I can't explain to you what began to happen. I began to build a relationship with the landlord and he dropped our mortgage down to $1,000 a month. We began to uh, get uh, a neighboring church that started for a whole year to give $300 a month towards help with whatever we need, no questions asked. The church that they had rented started to give a little bit more about $500 a month. Now, it doesn't sound like much, but here you go. Now we're at $1,000 a month, and you have 800 of that taken care of. Guess what? And the pastor didn't take a salary. We didn't take anything from the church because we wanted to see that church grow, and the church actually started to grow, and it started to do things. I say all that because I want to share with somebody today. I want to tell somebody today. You cannot outgive God. You cannot outgive God. I want to challenge you today because some of you might not even give. And I, you might be in a situation where you feel like, oh, I, I can't, I can't do that. I'm going to challenge you. Test God. Watch and see what God does. I was talking with some folks 
folks here at our church. And I thought about bringing them up and giving their story. I should have done that. But some of the most amazing things happen when they are obedient. And when they said, you know what, Lord, nothing I have here is mine. It's all yours. We cannot outgive God. You see, I, when I was going through this time, I was, I was really struggling. With, I mean, that's a terrible facility. We have a beautiful facility compared to that. But I was really struggling. God, how can we make a difference? How can we do anything? And there was one guy that was an older gentleman, uh, of my, a friend of mine. He didn't go to the church, but he challenged me with this. He said, Josh, how big is your God? How big is your God? And man, I still think about that today. And that's a long time ago. How big is your God? You see, when we started at our highest point of debt, you know, when we were like living paycheck to paycheck, when we were trying to do stuff, I tried to get the church to start giving away stuff. And guess what? God just doubled it, tripled it. It was amazing, guys. I, I can't, I don't know. I do not know how it happens. I, there's no magic formula. But before long, we, we didn't even have to worry about our mortgage. We didn't have to worry about the rent, I should say. You know, and even here, I mean, this church is almost 100 years old. Almost 100 years old. And you know what's beautiful about this? And I've said this, you know, for a while since last year, since we started to. But are you ready for this? As of today, we are debt-free as a church. Amen? We are debt-free. Yeah. Not a single mortgage on a single building that we own. We own a, a parsonage. We, we own this property. And we are debt-free. Why? Because we here were good stewards of the money and the blessings that God has given us. Amen. But all the glory goes to God. Amen? You cannot outgive God. You can't. So my second point, I'm, I'm continuing on. We will live, I believe here at our church, we will lead the way with irrational generosity because I truly believe that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Guys, it's not a game. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. And we're going to be intensely devoted to people. We're going to be irrationally generous and the, the last thing I want to share, we will be unapologetically, unapologetic, we will unapologetically, excuse me, share the love of Jesus in all that we do. If you are not modeling Jesus in your everyday life, then I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm probably going to call you out. Okay? I know people don't like pastors that call you out, but I'm probably, I can't, we don't know how long we have here. In your character, in some of the things that you do, if it's affecting somebody's relationship with God, guess what? I'm not going to be the one to answer for it. You are. So we will be unapologetic about sharing the love of Jesus with every single person that we do. And you see it right here in the book of Acts. When the believers had this proscatero, the radical devotion that I shared to Jesus and his word, scripture says the most amazing thing. When they completely devoted to the work of God in the church, as the church, what happened? The Lord added to their congregation what? Daily. What an amazing picture of what God did when they truly became devoted to Jesus Christ. Daily. Daily were people saved. Daily the Lord added to the number who were saved. And you know why? Because the power of the gospel transforms lives. The power of the gospel transforms lives. And that's why, in my opinion, we will say, or in my opinion, we'll say, we'll do anything short of sin to reach people who don't know Jesus Christ. If you do not know Jesus Christ, man, I'd love to share you my story. And you guys all have a story as well to tell. Amen. I don't want to insult God for our church with small thinking, safe living. You know, I've had people tell me, well, you guys are just a small community. You're a rural community. Listen to me. We are just getting started, church. Amen? We are just getting started. Yeah, Bishop shared last week with you guys, and he shared a little bit more with me, his feelings about this church. 
He feels that God has huge plans for this church. I believe that. Rachel and I and my family would not have come if we did not believe that. We know God has huge families for great or huge, huge plans for Grace Point Community Church. We are just getting started. And I'm telling you right now, as long as I'm your pastor, if there's one person, one person who's broken, one person who's suicidal, one person, you know, about to give up, one person who can't get free from drugs, one person who's still in bondage to addiction or pornography, one person who's still living in abuse, one person who's trapped in human trafficking, one person who has not yet heard the living word of God. We will not stop to seek, love, and to share. Amen? You see, you might say, well, man, he's getting a little fired up about this. Yes, I am. Because in, in dealing with this message, I want to give you some statistics that I found. And this is from 2022, okay? Well, the first one, I already knew this. But 1.5% of pastors leave the pulpit each year. Each year. They're tired. They're burned out. But this is, this is the one that, you might have heard some of these, but this is the one that is troubling. The decline of Christians in the U.S. has been matched by a rise in the religiously unaffiliated. Their number has almost doubled since 2007. From 16,000, or I mean, I'm sorry, 16% to 29%. 29% they say, hey, we don't have any religious affiliation. Hey, we don't believe in God. Well, we kind of do, but we believe in multiple things. 29%. Back in the day, some of you that have been around a while, you know that would never have happened back in the day. We are living in a totally different time, church totally different time and we could just sit on our pews and we could just sit on our seats and just kind of try to choose to ignore it but guess what it ain't going away we're 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 on the other side of the spectrum one in six young adults identify as lgtbq one in six young adults almost every christian student will have an lgbtq friend or classmate so you know what that tells me? Church leaders must speak on issues of sexuality with truth, but also with love. With truth and with love. So I'm going to share a couple more with you. 47% of Americans are members of a house of worship. 47%. Less than half of Americans say they belong to a, a, a house of worship. Religious membership was stable throughout the 20th century, but fell from 70% to 47% in 2020. What is the church doing? What are we doing? Um, let me share a few more with you. This is a troubling one for me. In 2019, 4,500 U.S. Uh, Protestant churches closed. 4,500 closed. Another one that I don't like to hear, three in ten unchurched Americans say a Christian has shared the gospel with them. Just three in ten. That's 29%, folks. 57% of Americans think at least monthly about how they can find more meaning and purpose. 57%. And see, we're wondering, God, how do we, where's our purpose? People are wondering that outside. And what are we doing to share the gospel with them? 39% of Americans see pastors as honest. That's not a good stat. I am honest with you, I promise that. 37% of Americans have confidence in the church. 37%, which is not good. 41% of Americans want to avoid fear most. That's one of the things they, they're, they're fearful of, is fear. 41%. Churchgoers are twice as likely as the average American to be 65 and older. That's the age of church goers right now 65 and older twice as likely um 
Not only are congregations growing older, so are their leaders. The average clergy is 57 today compared to 50 in 2000. So I still got a little bit to go. I'm getting there, though. Here's what I do love. I do love this. This is a positive. I'm sharing these negative stats. But a positive, 69% of evangelicals look for opportunities to speak with their neighbors. I love that. 69%. Why? Because we're sharing Jesus with our neighbors. That's awesome. 15% during COVID of Americans say they normally don't attend church services but watched online during the pandemic. 15%. That's pretty big. So that's why it's important to get our live stream going in the way it needs to be. 45% of Americans say they've watched um, a Christian church service online during the COVID, um, during the COVID um, pandemic. 65 people attend the median U.S. church each week. Seven in 10 U.S. churches have 100 or fewer weekly in their worship uh, attendance. And so I say all that because it is time that the church stepped up. It is time that we became the Acts 2 church and said we will stop at nothing to share the love of Jesus Christ, the story of Jesus Christ. I have more statistics about teenagers that would alarm you, about kids that would alarm you, but I, I don't really have time because time is running short, so I can share that with you uh, in another, another setting. But So those are some of the stats we found. So as your shepherd, this has been on my heart since we've been here, folks. In 2024, we will continue to invest in our kids and family ministries here at the church, placing an emphasis on them for not only the future, but also right here, right now in the present. Because we need to be making an eternal investment in the lives of these kids and the lives of these students. Because the schools aren't going to do that. Their friends aren't going to do that. You heard some of the statistics. And you know what? If we are not careful, what can happen? Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2 verse 10 says this. And, and there came a generation, or, and all that generation were also gathered to their fathers. So they were kind of gathered sitting there together. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work he had done for Israel. We will not be a church that the generation, the present and the future does not know the Lord. Amen. We will not, st I will not stand. I will not stand for that. We will relaunch our senior adult ministries here at the church because here's the thing. Yes, our kids and our teens are extremely important to us. They're, they're our present. They're our future. But so are you. That doesn't mean like, hey, just because we're going to be focused on our family ministries and stuff that you fall by the wayside. You are vital here. You all play a role. I mean that with all my heart. We need you. There are families that are my family's age that are struggling with things that we need you to speak into our lives. I'm telling you right now, there's moms that need you. There's dads that need you. So we will, we need you here. We need everybody. Uh, we will also be intentional about building disciple making relationships within the church family. That's what it's about. Equipping our people to model Jesus in every area of your life. For example, one of the ways we do that, with the women's Bible study that Rachel's been doing, I encourage you, if you haven't been there, go check it out. Um, we just started a men's one. We're going to continue with the men's one. Uh, one thing that I am excited about, you might have heard me say this in the class. Um, next week, I'm going to be talking more about it in the class if you haven't been a part of that discovery class. But uh, we're going to be launching point groups. And what is a point group? A point group is basically something that we can get together. We can disciple one another. Um, disciple one another and grow together. Spiritually, it's like Acts chapter 2. They met in their homes and the Lord added to their congregation daily. That's basically what a point group is. Doing life together, living life to the fullest. We'll have come to the table events with the pastors. 
come to the table events. So the point groups in the fall, we're hoping to do that by. And what again, what they are is designed to disciple one another in a biblically based way. This is the hard part. I challenge you guys. I'm challenging you guys this today. I'm not going to do this every week, okay? I don't like to do this every week. But I believe that we need to give. I believe that if you're not giving, I think you need to pray about God. Convict me. God, tell me what you want me to give. Even if it's $10 extra of your tithe a month. Did you know if we have 120 people here, and I'm not a math genius, so you can check me on this. But if we have 120 people in here every Sunday, and everybody gives uh, $10 extra above their, their tithe and offering, let's do this. I better be safe so I don't spew false, false information to you. So 10 times 120, that's $1,200 a week extra, okay, that we can have for ministries, that we can give towards missions, that we can give towards missions here in the community, that we can give towards other things like that. So $1,200 a week times 52 weeks a year is $62,000 basically. $10 a week. Sacrifice that Big Mac for one week. Sacrifice it. Where, and I'm not just saying for you to do it, my wife and I, and I'm not saying, hey, I'm patting myself on the back, but we've been doing that for a few weeks now. Be good stewards of what the Lord has provided for you. And if you're not doing it, pray about what the Lord's doing. Ask God, God, what can I do? And watch him show up and show out. So we've already started being the hands and feet this year of Christ by doing the essentials pantry. If you don't know what that is, that's for anybody that needs help. That's for anybody. That, so like government assistance for food does not cover like deodorant, does not cover like toilet paper, uh, which is a hot commodity nowadays, does not cover um, paper towels, toothbrushes, toothpaste and stuff. So my wife and I had the idea of let's open up this essentials uh, ministry, essentials ministry to, uh, to help people in our community. No questions asked, free of charge. Come once a month and take what you need. Give, give, give. So that's what we're doing. That's, and that's been going very well. Get plugged in with that. If you need something, don't be shy. Don't be shy. We're all a big family. And the last thing, start serving somewhere. Start serving somewhere in the church. You guys, you are not just called to just sit on the sidelines, okay? One of my pet peeves, and I'm going to be honest with you, I always am, but one of my pet peeves is when somebody comes up to me and says, well, pastor, you know, that's your job to do. <laughs> I told you I'm going to speak truth to you. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded to you. And behold, this is the promise that I love. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So guess what? If you call yourself a believer in Christ, you have a job to do. You do. It's not just my job. It's not just the leadership's job here. I want to invite you. Don't just come to church. Be the church. Change your devotions. Change the object of your devotion. One thing that might be easier for you, and if the worship team wants to come, devote one thing towards Jesus and work towards the rest. So what might your one thing be? I'll give you some options. I'm so glad everybody's asking in this quiet service today. What might you do? Start reading God's word. Start reading his word. Be serious about it. Start reading his word. If you're not reading God's word, you might start reading God's word daily so you can start feeding on his plans for your life. You know, there's the YouVersion app. There's the, the tabs and stuff. Get a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, I'd love to give you a Bible. It's really important. You know why? Because when we read the Word, 
It's living and it's active and it's going to get in you and it will transform you. And I promise you, if you read it and you devote yourself to it, you're not going to be the same. Amen. You will not be the same once you start doing it. You might consider serving in the church. You know, listen to me. Everybody has a gift to be used by God for God in the church. In other words, if you're just sitting there watching and you don't do something, then there's an unfulfilled assignment with your name on it. How can we just sit by and just watch? We are the church. We are the church. It said it in Matthew 28. Serve the church. Serve. Serve one another in love. You might, things might get weird, but you're going to start making a difference in all these ways, and you'll get obsessed with serving people in the world. Get plugged in when we launch the life groups, the point groups in the fall. Or even more, come to me and say, you know what, Pastor, I feel led to be part of that group. I want to lead the group. I want to be part of it. Here's what I know. This is what's happened to Rachel and I. When we started to get close to somebody, we started to care for people. When you get close to someone, you're going to start caring for people. You'll start praying for people. You'll start visiting them. You'll start doing missions work together. And then all of a sudden, you become this little army for God, for the glory of God. And our focus is not on ourselves. It's not on the consumerism of church. It's about discipleship. So those groups will be laser focused on that. Notice Jesus didn't say, go make people who are good. Or go to church. Or go to church. We already talked about tithing. We already talked about uh, certain things. I, I need to fast forward because I want to get you out past one o'clock. So that was a joke. That was a joke. One of the things, I, I'm just going to be honest with you. I've been feeling really, really... Um, I don't even know how to describe what I've been feeling. Um, and I want to thank Mia, Mia for doing a phenomenal job. I, she's downstairs with our teens, but we've got to invest into a student ministry. Amen. Because I'm going to tell you, there's some people I'm looking at right now that are here because of a youth group. I am here preaching the word of God because of my experience with the youth group and some of those statistics that if if we don't do that guess what there's going to be another generation after them that did not know the lord and i do not want to be a church like that so with that being said we have been in communication with a phenomenal young couple that uh is serving in student ministry right now that they actually came surprised i didn't tell anybody this who they were but they came and and they they are very interested in becoming part of our church building up a solid discipleship based youth group uh, here in Grace Point. So we're excited about that. We're excited about the future with them. Um, so just be the church. Amen. Let's be the church and let's make an impact to advance the kingdom. Let's bow our heads. You know, there's some of you that are here and this is, this is definitely a different normal, not a normal service and, and things like that that I normally preach. But I believe that there's some that might be here that are broken, some that are lost, some that are desperate. You know, one statistic I did not share, that over 36% of Americans don't feel they have a good, a healthy relationship with any friends. 36% from one of the statistics that I saw just this morning. We gotta do better. We have got to do better. We're not alone. God created us for relationships, healthy relationships, biblically based relationships. And so I'm praying that our church becomes a disciple making church where we're where he's adding to us daily. Amen. He's adding people daily to us. And we're helping people and we're serving people. So I want to. I want to just encourage you, if, if some of those things, that's what some of you guys are, or if you're thinking about that, maybe you felt guilty, maybe you've been ashamed of something, of a sin. Guys, that was me. That was, I was all those things. 
But as I said, as I read in the word, as I read about Jesus, the sinless son of God who, who gave his life for me, and God raised him for the dead, from the dead so I can be forgiven. The Bible says that no matter who you are, doesn't matter what you've done, but that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, your sins are going to be forgiven. And guess what? You will become brand new in Christ Jesus. So I say all that because the power of the gospel, the good news is for you. God loves you. He loves you so very much. He's ready for you. He's reaching out to you right now where you are. You may have gone to a church like I said before. But you don't know who the God of the universe is. You might have attended here. You just don't have that authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. I implore you to step away from your old life. Step towards Jesus. He loves you. He's forgiving you. And you'll become brand new. Adopted into his family. The church. We are the church. So if there's anybody here this morning that says to me, Josh, you know what? I, I've, been, I've been wrong in my thinking about the church and I need forgiveness. I need Jesus's grace. And I, I say yes to Jesus right now. Is there's anybody there? Could you please just slip your hand up real quick, real quick. Father God, I pray right now that you would just empower your church. Empower the people, God, here in the Grace Point community by the power of your Holy Spirit to use their gifts that you've given each and every single one of them to give life, to give hope, to give freedom and victory to this community, God, to help people's lives to be changed through your grace. God, may you use this church to, to raise up an army of devoted Christ followers devoted to you, devoted to your word and to sharing the gospel message, to preach your word to the lost, to the, to the lost that need to hear it and bring redemption to them, Father. God, I pray that we are your church. I pray, God, that, that we step out of our comfort zones and I pray that we make an impact in this community and across this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and worship?
All right, before we dismiss, at your pews, there's a little paper like this. If there isn't, let us know as you leave. One side says home, one side shows work, and there's all these open blocks. So this is a good first step in devotion and generosity and in love. Right on the home side, names of family members. On the back side for work, people you work with. If you're retired, people you used to work with. People in your community that you know and care about. And then take this when you go to pray and dedicate time praying and lifting up the people on your list. Write small so that you can continue to add to this list so that we can add to the kingdom daily. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your love and devotion for us. And Lord, I pray that we can be generous with that same type of love and devotion for one another and for the lost, Lord. To add to your kingdom for your glory daily, Lord, is what we're called to do. So Lord, I pray that we show the same grace, love, and mercy that's been shown to us. We show that to others, that we take you with us outside these walls as we leave here today as changed believers to change other people to be believers. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Oh, my words fall short.